differentiating yourself in a sea of sameness is vitally important and critical if you want return customers. According to Forbes, companies with a customer experience mindset drive revenue 4 to 8 percent higher than the rest of their industries. 73 percent of customers report that a good customer experience is key to determining their brand loyalties. Meanwhile, 77% of consumers report that a bad customer experience detracts from their overall quality of life. David Atherin is a customer experience and keynote speaker and the chairman of the Legacy Board. He works with companies both internationally and domestically to answer one primary and central question. Why customers leave and how to win them back. He works with companies to also dramatically change customer expectations and consults with companies to help them avoid the major pitfalls they make when it comes to designing and delivering their customer interactions. Avrin joined me this week to have a conversation about customer experience and to answer the age-old question, is the customer always right? I'm Kevin McShane. Let's have this conversation. Take a moment to welcome you to the program, and I'm super excited to learn all about the good work you do to help companies improve their customer experience. Great to see you this morning, and thank you so very much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It's a uh, it's a beautiful day here in Denver, Colorado, and uh, thrilled to to be on the show and to talk to you and your listeners. Well, David, I have to tell you, I'm super excited to engage in conversation with you this morning, and they tell me that you're the leading authority as to why customers leave and how to gain them, gain them back. So I'm wondering if you can tell me about all the great work that you do. Sure. Um, I am, I, I've spent my most of my career actually in marketing and branding. And I, I used to work with organizations. I, I did a lot of consulting, but I also spoke for a lot of years about how to help organizations better describe what they do, their differentiation, not just what they do well, but what they do better than others. And I saw a really, Kevin, I saw a really remarkable shift in the marketplace that I think many of us have seen and experienced which is there was just a big shift and it became less important what we say about ourselves. It's not unimportant, but it's less important than what other people say about us. And so I began the research uh, about what is it that that's driving customers, pardon my language, what's pissing people off that's, that's causing them to leave companies, companies that do very good work, great products, great services, and, um, and that's what resulted in my book, Why Customers Leave and How to Win Them Back. And we're in seven languages now because it struck a nerve. And so now I spend my time working with organizations. I, I speak at a lot of conferences around the world as well, um, teaching organizations how to become ridiculously easy to do business with. That really is the differentiator today. There's no shortage of great companies. I mean, I, I, I hear clients and, and, and other business owners talk about, uh, you know, their differentiation. You know what makes us different? 
we really listen to our customers or they'll say it's our people or it's our quality or experience. The reality is everybody's good. I mean, you wouldn't, if you weren't good today, you wouldn't survive because we've got right social proof as TripAdvisor and Yelp and Rotten Tomatoes and Glassdoor. There's no shortage of mechanisms for people to complain about companies that underperform. So the differentiation today is less about quality. I mean, everybody's good or at least good enough. Today, it's, it's how easy are you to work with? How easy are you to buy from and to engage with and to ask questions of? Um, it, it, uh, in, in a marketplace where everything is equal, right? I, I talk about that. The four most dangerous words in business are all things being equal. When everything's equal, we shop based on price, right? Or proximity. So when everybody's good, where is our opportunity for differentiation? And today, it's customer experience. And to be clear, it's, I don't talk about customer service. My God, we've been talking about this for 40 years. You either know how to treat people or you don't. The experience is different. It's what's it like for us to do business? How complicated is your process? How frustrating is your process? Do you make it really difficult to complain or to ask a question or to talk to a real person? Um, if COVID taught us anything, um, and, and I make it clear that I, I don't talk about COVID, but it very much about a co post COVID world is in many ways, COVID accelerated what has long been predicted about how we're going to do business. Look at our life today. We get our groceries delivered. We can do most things, buy most things with one touch. That's the experience today. So that's what I do. I, I travel around, I work with organizations, I consult and I speak to help them find real differentiation by becoming ridiculously easy to do business with. That, that's fabulous. And you know, uh, one, one of the things that COVID has also taught us, David, is the importance of adapting and the importance of diversity, you know. Absolutely. With, with the pandemic, you know, a lot of uh, people are now working from home. So tell me, how do you think companies can shift their marketing to appeal to a, a wider variety of audiences because, you know, the, the brick and mortar experience is sort of going by the wayside and e-commerce is, be, is becoming uh, more sure. prevalent. So I'm wondering your thoughts in that regard as well. Well, here's the other thing, and, and I don't mean to sound cynical, but for a, lot, a long time, and you do, you do a lot of work in this area, <clears throat> organizations would check a box. Right, we brought in our diversity and inclusion speaker, check the box, so that in case they get sued, look, we brought somebody and talk about it. Smart companies recognize that there is a wealth of, of talent and experience and creativity in everyone. And those marginalized communities that have long been, um, I don't know that they've been maliciously forgotten, but companies are always going to opt for the majority because that's where most of the money is. And Smart companies recognize there's phenomenal talent and, and creativity, and, and especially from a worker perspective. Um, I mean, those working from home, who cares what, what, what somebody looks like? You know, if they're differently abled, um, really smart companies are recognizing that, uh, and, and, and you've seen a lot of them like during challenges in, in finding right workers. And then all of a sudden, they're tapping into a new community and they realize in many ways they're expanding their, their outlook in terms of, of where the talent is, expanding their, their perception of, of what uh, abilities and quality, all of that ultimately is profitable. Uh, I don't think we do it because it's necessarily just the right thing to do. It's smart. It's smart business. I, I worked with, I'll, I'll take you, I, I <clears throat> excuse me, I interviewed um, this remarkable woman from Colombia. And she was working with big organizations who were struggling to bring in um, some minority workers, coders, a lot of people in Silicon Valley and things like that. And the biggest problem was that they were struggling to get through the interview process. They were struggling to get through, like some people who are coming from other countries and others as well, just because they weren't experienced with how that process works. They could have been phenomenal employees, but they couldn't even get through their own internal process. And so these big companies, Dell, Microsoft, Apple, and all these others are working with this company to help prep people for the interview so they can get past HR because we're finding a bottleneck that they're missing so much talent 
in the in the differently abled community, in the LGBTQ, in the in the um, the foreign nationals and others as well. And maybe maybe one of the the few positive outcomes from COVID is that it's forced companies to look beyond the traditional easy targets and appreciate what diversity can do for them from the perspective of helping them produce better quality products and services, better internal processes, understand their diverse audience better. So I think both from the customer perspective and the employee perspective, um, I think a lot of eyes are being opened and hopefully it's permanent. Hopefully the, that the work that you're doing and so many others is starting to register in a significant way because I think it's really important. Yeah, it's certainly important. A diversity of perspective goes a long way, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, there, I heard a great line once that says, when you're trying to get somebody to do what you want them to do, let's just say inclusion and diversity, for example, um, when you're trying to get somebody to do something you want them to do, don't appeal to their better nature. They may not have one. Appeal to their self-interest and you'll get farther. I didn't make that up, but it's a great line. Um, we're not doing it because it's the right thing to do, even though they should. Do it because it's smart. It's smart business, bringing a whole nother category of life experience and perspective into your organization makes you better. Indeed. And David, I know that you spend a great deal of time working with companies to try and help them uh, design a better customer expectation. So I, I'm, I was fascinated to ask you about what's the biggest mistake you think companies make when it comes to designing their customer expectations and experiencing the results that hope to encounter? I'm curious. All right, here's, here's the biggest mistake. It's a great question. So I'll tell you, so I've been on a lot of podcasts and I do my own podcast as well. And somebody was asking me once on a podcast, because I had just come out with one of my uh, my customer experience books. And he says, David, if we've been talking about this for 40 years, and I think he was talking more about customer service, he says, if we've been talking about it for 40 years, how could this possibly be getting worse? <laughs> and I said, it is getting worse. And that's to answer your question, Kevin, it's getting worse because we've become more rigid in our business model and our customer journey. And let me explain what I mean. There's so many things we can't control. Right? It's frustrating as a business owner, as a manager, we can't control our competitors or technology or pandemics right? or, or commodity prices. So we try to control what we can. So we, we came up with this whole concept of the customer journey or journey mapping, right? Here's how our, the journey our customers go on and how can we influence that, that and, make it, and make it work. So if we go all the way back to the beginning of when somebody realizes they have a problem or a need, and then they go online, they look for a solution, and then they find us. And then they reach out and they contact and they ask and they buy and then they customize and then they purchase and pay and it's delivered and follow up, whatever that path is in your business model. It works. We design it, right? And if it doesn't work, then we tweak it until it does. Because if we can have a greater level of predictability of our customer's behavior and their purchases, then we can have a greater predictability of our cash flow and our profits. And we can, we can plan for that and we can hire for that. Here's the problem to answer your question. The problem is your customers have never read your employee manual. They don't know how they're supposed to do it. They just know how they want to do it. And so the biggest problem, the biggest mistake that organizations make is they get married to their own model. And then when somebody wants to skip the line or somebody has a special request, we get angry or we don't know what to do with that because you're supposed to do it this way. Well, right. If you're Chipotle, that works, right? You line up here, you order your burrito, you customize it, you pay, you get your drink and you sit down. Most of us don't have business models that are that easy. And so people get very frustrated because companies seem to be tone deaf. Somebody wants something a little bit different and the company gets frustrated. Now understand that we can't stop a major manufacturing effort for a one-off, right? We still have some processes we have to follow, but we are entering an age, and this is part of my message when I work with organizations, we are entering an age that will require an extraordinary level of flexibility, of accommodation. It's the whole omni-channel. No matter how somebody wants to buy, my God, let them buy. It doesn't mean that I expect to get my hair cut at four o'clock in the morning. 
but I do expect I can make an appointment to do so, right? Um, I heard a presentation and a guy had a really interesting statistic. He said only 23% of companies have adopted an always on business model to accommodate their always connected customers, right? Speaking broadly to companies, do you make it difficult to reach you? I'm one of those people that I'm on the phone going, real person, real person, real person, no, seven, real person, right? And we get so frustrated because all of a sudden we work for their HR department. Please listen closely as our menu options have changed. And you're on for 40 minutes when a real person, now I understand challenges of hiring and everything else, but companies that are losing today are not recognizing the changes that have happened. And maybe we aren't Amazon, but Amazon is changing our expectations. We're all changing. I asked clients, I said, anybody notice, or like I'll be in front of an audience, anybody notice that your customers are a little more impatient, a little more demanding, and they all laugh like, you know, welcome to my life. Well, we all are because we're being trained by organizations who are ridiculously easy to do business with find information, talk to a real person, order whenever we want, order with one click. And so I encourage organizations to walk their customer's journey and look for points of friction, look for points of delay. You can have the greatest products and services in the world. And if I have to wait for them, I probably won't because somebody else can do it faster. And that opens the door for a lot of disruption, right? People thinking of different ways of doing what we're doing. And so back to your question, I know it's a very long answer. Um, the biggest mistake companies are making is they are, are married to their model that probably worked for them 10 or 20 years ago, but the world has changed in significant ways. And so they need to re-examine, can we shorten a process? If a customer has to take 14 steps to get to what they want, what would it mean to your competitive advantage if we could cut half of those steps out, right? We, we've been in a position where we're at like a buffet, right? And there's a big long line at the buffet and we just want a drink. Should we have to stand behind 14 people who want, who are deciding between three bean salad and hummus, or can we skip the line and go get our drink? It's the same thing with organizations. Don't make people do extra work. Um, and there's a great opportunity in that. That's what customer experience is today. Can we uh, enhance that experience? Can we be super easy and super tapped into how our customers have changed? Yeah, absolutely. And you brought this up in your uh, last answer, David. One of, one of the things I wanted to ask you this morning is the difference between the authentic customer experience and the automated one. Because as you were Great to question. As you alluded to, there are so many automated systems now when you a call for customer service or a customer experience. So I'm, I'm wondering if you think the automated system is taking away from the authentic customer experience. Yeah, it's a great question. And, and it's exactly part of the problem today is there's a number of technology companies <clears throat> who are selling businesses on the idea of reducing their, their workload, reducing their challenges, reducing their payroll by automating certain processes or the do-it-yourself kinds of things as well. And the challenge of that is, is if, something, if something is taken off your plate, um, a work task, and given to the customer instead, you are likely losing. When you go to a doctor's office and they hand you the tablet and you have to navigate their technology to find out how to fill in all this information. And I'm like, oh, so your receptionist doesn't have to fill in the information. Let's give it to the guy that's bleeding. That makes a whole lot of sense, right? Automation makes sense for routine tasks, like, like outreach for billing, newsletters, those kinds of things, right? Bulk email. But when it comes to individual communication, we want to personalize those. But even when it comes to, to FAQs, right, you'll see a lot of chatbots today. And of course, bot stands for robot. It's AI. It's getting better. It's not great, but it's getting better. It's basically an electronic FAQ, right? Frequently asked questions. My challenge is most of my questions aren't frequently asked. And so to answer your question, technology is here to stay. I'm not anti-technology, but 
technology works as long as there is an off-ramp to a real person. Give people choices. If they want to just go through and do the automated part, give them that option. This is what Omnichannel is, right? But if somebody wants to work with a real person, don't make it difficult to do so. For example, my wife, she loves self-checkout at the grocery store. I hate it. Like I hate it to the point where I get so angry because every item is an unexpected item in the bagging area for me, right? I was, I was at our local Walmart and I had a shopping cart over packed with groceries. And one of the managers tries to direct me to self-checkout. And I'm thinking, I don't work here. I mean, I didn't say it out loud because I don't want to be sound like I'm, I'm being diminishing. I'm horrible at it. Like I'm horrible. I don't want to do self-checkout. I want to go to a real person and they'll tell you, um, no, 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 we give you it, but we give you the choices, but it's not a choice. It's not a choice. If you have 23 self-checkout lanes and one staffed checkout lane with nine carts in a row, that's social engineering. That's them trying to get you to do business the way they want you to, as opposed to legitimate choices. So we go back to your point about automation. Automation is here to stay. It is helpful in so many ways, as long as people have a legitimate choice. But when you take the choice away, people get frustrated. It goes back to my the whole assertion of, of why customers leave. Customers leave because they can. Customers leave because they're frustrated. And when you cut staff or, or push so many tasks to your customers, at some point, even though your bean counters are happy because you just saved a lot of money in staffing, there is the law of diminishing return. And at some point, they get so frustrated and tired of the hassle that they just leave and they go to a competitor. And so part of my work and with companies is helping them to recognize where the balance is. Um, I understand the costs and the challenges of hiring people, and I'm not such an absolutist. I say it's always got to be real people. Just give people a choice. I think chatbots are here to stay. I want to text with a real person. I think self-checkout is inevitable. Give me the option of a real person. And so it's the same thing. As I said before, I have a whole chapter of this in my book, Why Customers Leave, about be careful about efficiency at the cost of relationships. Yes, I can hit one button and I can email 10,000 people. At what cost? Are 20% of those potentially somebody who might have responded if they had gotten an individual one? So I'm really happy with myself. I was super efficient, but did I was I effective? And so all of this is within the context of a very competitive marketplace. If we were only looking at within a vacuum at one company and their behavior, it would be very different than when we recognize that all of us have choices, right? The key today is to be a better choice. And the better choice is having a really easy to navigate um, customer experience. A lot, a lot of my colleagues talk about the importance of creating a wow experience. The key is creating a wow. I don't think it is. I don't think most business models lend themselves to wow experiences. If your company creates an electronic component that goes into a bigger part that goes into a lawnmower, there's not a lot of wow in that. But you know where there's wow? Is somebody not having to ask four times to get a status of their order, right? A wow is being able to get what they want um, without unexpected challenges, right? And so I, I don't mean to be all over the place, but I, I think automation has a place for those who want to opt for it. Give people choices, right? People can talk about millennials, right? Here's they don't want to be on the phone. I don't know many industries that only deal with one generation. How many generations are out there buying right now? From the seniors to the boomers to the Xers and the Gen Z, we have to cater to everybody. So give them choices. Yeah, David, you talk about uh, catering to everybody. And one of the things that I strongly believe is that representation matters. So tell me. Absolutely. What do you think about having more diversity and leadership and how that lends itself uh, to the overall customer experience? Well, I think we have a diverse um, buying public. So why on earth would we not have a diverse uh, leadership and diverse decision-making. 
I, I worked with an organization, a big international logistics company, and they brought me in for a full day and I worked with their team and four of them were on, on video screens because they were coming from Hong Kong and Istanbul and a few other places. And they were doing their, their strategic work to try and simplify their process. It was part of my teaching. Everybody in the room was over 50 years old. And I'm like, how are you supposed to understand the expectations of a generation that grew up in a digital world rather than an analog if that representation isn't in the room helping to streamline your process? So it goes back to your point in terms of diversity. If we're going to sell to a diverse audience, not, I'm an unapologetic, compassionate capitalist. There's no, no shame in making good money, doing good work and helping, helping people. But everybody's money spends as good as anyone else's. How do we understand different populations of how to serve them and cater to them and deliver to them if our leadership isn't representative of them? I'm not a big believer in checking a box for the sake of checking, checking a box or making sure that we, we promote externally. Look at the great work we're doing on diversity. Do it because it's profitable. I mean, it's, it's good that, that, that we talk about it. I think it's good that we all talk about it. Um, but nobody's asking somebody to, nobody's asking anybody for charity, right? It's smart business. So once again, I appreciate the work that you do. I think it's so important that if we're going to design products and services and delivery models for a diverse population, then leadership and representation within the organizational structure has to mirror that to some extent just because we'll make better decisions. And to that point, David, I'm wondering your thoughts on what challenges do you think good, good corporate leaders present? That's a really broad question. Um, I, I think those who, I mean, leadership is different. It's not my subject, but it's something that I experience every day. Um, they have to be able to model the policies that they employ within their organization. Everybody's watching. Um, they, they, they watch the employees who have bad behavior that are tolerated. Everybody's watching. And when there is a salesperson who's a jerk and treats people poorly, but they generate a lot of revenue and they're not held accountable for that behavior, everybody notices. And so, um, my father used to say, and my father was was big project manager in, in aerospace. He was a rocket scientist. And he would always say a, uh, uh, a good employee who is a team player, is a, is, he will always opt for over a jerk who is a high performer because it poisons an organization. And so from a leadership perspective, I think, I think it starts at the top. And we talk a lot about service empathy. Can you really put yourself in the position of your customers, understand their life and their challenges and their and their hopes and their dreams and their loves and their aspirations and their needs and wants, not just what they're willing to buy, because the more we can get inside their their head, that's that customer centricity that's really important. But I think it's the same thing for our employees. Um, but I think from a leadership perspective, I think if we model those behaviors and we are those people, it's easier to attract and retain those as well. And Devin, what do you think about the notion of the the customer always being right. Oh, customers is often wrong. I mean, sometimes I'm wrong as the customer, but but it's a bad adage. Um, I, I, the customer always has to be respected. Sometimes one of the most powerful things we can do is, is fire customers, right? Who are toxic in our relationship or don't treat our employees well. Um, but I, I think uh, the customer isn't always right. But here, here's one of the things that, that I teach as well. When I talk about sort of this entering this age that will require an extraordinary level of flexibility and accommodation, the answer isn't always yes, right? There's organizations say we've taken no out of our vocabulary. The answer isn't always yes. Um, but here's the best response. This, this, is, this is the biggest takeaway for your entire audience. Even when the answer is no, and sometimes it is, like I'll give you an example. If you had a vegan restaurant and somebody wanted to order a buffalo burger. Sorry, dude, it's a hard no, right? That's a no. Um, and some of the things that they ask, even in terms of, of expediting an order, some kind of customization, sometimes we just can't, right? Here's the response that I train 
frontline workers and others as well. Even when there's a request, there's something that we can't do. Here's the answer. Let me tell you what I can do. And then everything that follows that, as long as, as it is of service, is, is one of the most beneficial things you can do as an organization. You can't always do what they want. The customer isn't always right, but we can always be of service. So even when, I mean, I'll give you an example. I, I flew into Johannesburg in South Africa. I've spoken to 24 countries around the world. I'm really blessed to be able to travel. I get into Johannesburg in South Africa. I get to my hotel at 6 a.m. And my keynote presentation is at 1 p.m. Check-in at the hotel is until 3 p.m. Uh -huh. And so normally when I get in, I do a lot of international. Sometimes I get there in the middle of the night and they say, I'm so sorry, Mr. Evan, we don't have any rooms. We will call or text you when your room is available. And then I just sit in the lobby of the hotel with my leg over my luggage and just try and get some sleep. But this, this one young woman just had a phenomenal response. So I showed up at 6 a.m. in Johannesburg and she says, I'm so sorry, Mr. Aberrant in her wonderful South African accent. And she says, um, we don't have any rooms available. Our checkout isn't even until three o'clock, but uh, I understand that you're here for a presentation. Let me tell you what I can do. We have a hospitality suite that you are welcome to come in and get some rest. Uh, we can bring you an iron and an ironing board if you'd like to iron your clothes, your suit for your presentation. And let me give you a couple of passes to our, to our gym if you'd like to take a shower and answer so your, how wonderful is that, right? The easy answer is to tell me the truth, which is, sorry, your room won't be ready until three o'clock. But this was a person who was, who was of service. Customer isn't always right. I was inconvenient. I got there at six o'clock in the morning. My flight got in at like 4.30 but she was of service. And so that line, let me tell you what I can do, um, is a wonderful way to galvanize a, a relationship with your customers. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, David, it sounds like you've lived a pretty fulfilling and rewarding life. And one of the th th things that I'm really passionate about, David, is celebrating the wins in life, no matter how big or small. So I'm wondering, through all of your experiences and uh, professional uh, endeavors, I'm wondering how how is the best way that you uh, take stock and celebrate what you've been given in life? I'm curious, how do you celebrate life? You know what, boy, that's a great question. I think there's a pedestrian way and there's a broader way. The pedestrian way is, and I think it's just as important um, with my team and I have, have of those who work with me here in my office and my company, we always celebrate success. Um, uh, whether it's, it's taking time to acknowledge it, whether it's giving everybody the afternoon off or taking everybody to lunch. Uh, even when I used to lead CEO roundtable groups, um, here in the Denver area for, for Vistage uh, way back 15 years ago, I would tell my members, all of my CEO members in the group that let's respect each other's boundaries. If there is a challenge that you have, I'm, you, can always, you can always call me. But if it's after hours, let's try and respect that as much as we can. I'm always here for emergencies if you need it. And I said, but here's the caveat to that rule. Celebration is 24 seven. If you find out something at nine o'clock at night, that's a big win for your company, something maybe that we talked about as a CEO group together, share it with us because there's no better way to, to go to bed feeling great that we can celebrate each other's success. So um, that was my own policy for all our members, share success 24 um, seven. And so for, for me and for my, my beautiful wife, we, we take stock often, we're new empty nesters so five kids grown and gone. Um, it doesn't mean they're off the payroll, but at least they're out of the house. Um, and we just, we take stock. Uh, we take stock uh, in terms of, of gratitude. <clears throat> we try to live a life of abundance. And it's not about being touchy-feely. It's, you know, early part of my life, I was probably a little more volatile, a little more overly opinionated about everything because I was so smart. Uh, and as we get older, we realize maybe not quite as much, but we're also much more appreciative. And especially as I sort of enter my third act, um, I heard a great line that says that to recognize that we have more history than we have future. And I have more history than I have future, almost 59 years old. And so we really pause um, 
to recognize and be grateful for the the things that we have in our life and and the the love of family and and the work that we get to do for customers and clients. Um, I try to be to be heart led in the work that, that I do, uh, and that I that I hope that at the end of the day, you know, that I left the campsite better than I found it. Yeah, absolutely. And then, David, you shared with me earlier that you host a podcast, and I know that you've written some best selling books. So. Tell me about the podcast, buddy, and all all of the great uh, projects you sure. uh, have on the go that you can share with me this morning. Sure, uh, you're you're nice to ask. Um, I, I've been, uh, you know, every once in a while or every few years, when I feel like I've learned a lot more from my clients and others as well. I, I have a number of books out. You can just anybody can look me up at, at David Averin, A V R I N. Uh, on Amazon and others as well. But like I said, the first half, I spent a lot of time writing on marketing and branding. And I've made the shift in recent years to, I think, a, a more meaningful differentiator, which is customer experience. And, um, and my most recent book is a book called The Morning Huddle, uh, Powerful Customer Experience Conversations to Wake You Up, Shake You Up, and Win More Business. And it's based on a video, video series that I created where organizations around the world get a, uh, get a, a short video from me every week. And it's not motivation. It's a hard conversation about how we believe and behave and engage with our customers. And it's meant as a catalyst to get organizations talking. Some of the best information, Kevin, is from the people who are doing the work every day. The decisions are often made by, by leadership and management, but creating great conversation as teams and helping management know what's happening on the front lines and asking some hard questions about what do you do in this kind of a scenario and what's our belief system around people who are behaving this way or asking these kinds of things. And so that's the book that that, that video series ultimately turned into a book called The Morning Huddle. And, um, and I think it's the most powerful work that I've done uh, and great opportunity for organizations to, to have, uh, have some real conversations every week with their team. So, um, and then my website, if people want to learn more about me and the speaking or the work that I do, just look me up at davidaverin.com. Yeah, absolutely. And my final question for you yeah. this morning, David, has to do with your own individual legacy, buddy, and how you want that to be defined both personally and professionally. How about my legacy? You know, it's, it's kind of interesting that you bring this up, and I haven't really publicized this at all, but I, I'm working on on uh, roundtable groups, small communities of former business leaders to talk about just that subject, which is legacy. Um, to, to, uh, whether it's to leave the campsite better than we found it and to recognize that what are we going to do in the years that we have left? Uh, how do we redefine ourselves beyond the work? How do we take our, our expertise and help organizations that maybe wouldn't have been able to afford us otherwise, mentoring and being intentional about the legacy. I love that old adage that talks about the most important etching that's on your gravestone, right? It's not your name or the epitaph. It's not the, the day that you were born and it's not the day that you died. It's the dash, right? It's the dash between those dates because that dash represents the entirety of your life. What did you, what have you done? What have you learned, learned and earned and loved and lost? And, and I love working with people who aren't finished with their dash. And so my new, my new initiative, and if anybody wants to look it up, it's called thelegacyboard.com. And we're launching groups across America, of former business owners and leaders and CEOs to be intentional about, um, about their legacy and about fulfilling that bucket list and mending fences and, and leaving the world better than we found it. So that's a big, important initiative for me right now that I'm really excited about. And uh, my intention is to be intentional and not just um, be put out to pasture someday. Yeah, it's very important to be present, for sure. Well, David, I have to tell you that I thoroughly enjoyed engaging in conversation, As did I, my friend. conversation with you this morning about uh, customer experience. Your work in the space and time on my behalf is most appreciated, buddy, and I want to 
Thank you for being here today. Thank you, my friend. I, I appreciate the work that you do as well.